Christine, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, welcome to the next MEIB Brown Bag uh, with myself, Greg Robertson. Um, to say appreciate to Michael Poor, who's been present or at least hosting for the last couple of weeks uh, while I've been having a bit of a breather after my VCDX attempts. Um, tonight on the MEIB Brown Bag is Frank Bruchel. Frank will be going through the VCAP CID Objective 1, which is around creating a vCloud conceptual design. Um, but the strange way we've done it, we've gone through all of the objectives, and the objective we had left was Objective 1, which I guess should have been the first one. So hopefully people that are watching the recording can at least start with this one. Um, and hopefully that will finish the series. We may do another couple of deep dives, but yeah, we're quite booked up now, thanks to Jonathan Fapier for organizing so many of those. We've got quite a few people booked up, and if you guys haven't seen, um, we've got the whole of June booked out going over the VCP DCV, so we decided that we may as well go back to a lot of the VCP stuff, because a lot of people are still looking to do the VCP and we thought it would be quite beneficial to people. A lot of people thought it would be a good idea. So, yeah, we're going back on that. Um, so that will be starting beginning of June and going for almost a month and into even July. So, yeah, hopefully you guys can join that. Even if you aren't are already a VCP, we're going to be going through the VCP 5.5 blueprint. We will be trying to show the differences between the VCP 5 dot zero blueprint in the 5.5, .5, but we will do in 5.5 .5 because there's no point in doing the older one. And yeah, I think even people that are VCPs might learn some new stuff because not everybody's using 5.5 .5 yet. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for joining. Thanks to Frank for presenting. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can ask them in the question area or you can post them on Twitter with the hashtag VBrownBag. Um, I'll keep an eye out on Twitter and try and bring in your questions. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try and ask them to Frank. But I'm not going to. I'm going to try and do it so I don't interrupt him halfway. So, yeah, hopefully you guys get a lot of benefit out of this. And yeah, thanks to Frank. I think he's now with the most done the most <laughs> presentations on this MEOV brown bag um, out of anybody. So that's always greatly appreciated. Um, I think that covers everything. Um, yeah, so without wasting too much time, I'm going to make Frank the presenter, and then the hour is yours, Frank. Okay, you should see the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm not yep. mistaken. Yep. Why I'm great. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Um, let's see if everything works. Yeah, it does. Good. Yeah. Welcome to today's uh, V Brown Bag. Uh, as Greg already mentioned, we are going to cover the last objective, which is actually the first out of them all, create a vCloud conceptual design. Um, I won't have too many in-detail slides because a conceptual design is referred to as a napkin design, really. Um, from experience of taking the exam, most of the exam actually evolves around logical designs. You won't do too many conceptual designs or get too many questions on conceptual designs because it's it's a very, very high, like 30,000 foot view on the environment. And that's basically hard to score with, with uh, normal questions. So you can imagine, no, I do not want to change my color scheme. Thank you. Um, so you can imagine that um, you won't get too many questions on, on the conceptual design area. Um, if, if you feel like you, you're getting um, those kind of questions, um, 
they will actually rather look for um, for a little bit deeper logical design stuff in there. So expect a mi mixture out of both. VMware in the um, in the actual exam doesn't uh, cut clear borders between conceptual and logical design. So for those who haven't attended in the past weeks, a little introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Frank Buxel. I'm an escalation engineer uh, working at VMware in Cork. Um, you can follow me on Twitter with um, at of Buxel. And I'm quite a certification addict. Um, currently, I'm only missing out the um, VCAP for desktop um, administration. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we will talk a little bit about business requirements, how to evolve a conceptual design out of business, con uh, business requirements. Um, we will talk a little bit about VMware design methodology. You are free to use your own, but in an exam, you should do it the vendor way. So you should really go the vendor way, the VMware way, um, when um, creating your six design questions. Um, our next point will be um, to identify and categorize business requirements. We will have a look at um, capacity and availability requirements. Um, we will shortly talk about security and compliance. And our last point will be um, service, def uh, service definitions and a little bit about catalog design uh, from a very, very basic point of view. And for the rest of the hour, um, we will do Q&A. So let's jump into the first topic. Um, I won't read those out loud. Uh, as always, you will get the actual slide decks um, to, to download. So this is in there for a reference. But this is what VMware would expect you to know. So the first thing we should do is define a little bit. Um, VMware wants you to know what is virtualization. This can be defined as the simulation of software or hardware um, that software runs on. So basically, it's a layer of abstraction. VMware also wants you to know what automation is. And basically, it's abolishing manual labor processes. You're introducing control systems um, that are doing your operational work. And if you combine these two, if you combine virtualization and automation, you will get cloud computing. There is a broader definition, uh, definition out there for cloud computing. Um, VMware follows that NIST um, definition, which means cloud computing needs to have an on-demand self-service component. You don't need to go to your system administrators every time when you deploy something. You can do this yourself, either through a web portal um, or other means. It needs broad networking access. Cloud computing is all about resource pooling. This is basically the most important um, thing you will know about cloud computing. You do not care on which server it runs on. You don't even care on which cluster it runs on. You will get a pool of resources, and that includes CPU, memory, network, and storage, all the four big food groups. You get that assigned, and you deploy into that pool. You don't care about the underlying hardware, um, how it is set up, what the actual capabilities are you get service level agreements. It needs to be rapid um, elastic, so you can scale up very quickly. You can scale out very quickly. If your workload demands 500% more CPU on day two than it used to need on day one, 
a cloud computing environment needs to cope with that. And it needs to be a measured service. So it can be for free, but then it should have showback at least. Or it can be actually charged, um, so you're either being built by the hour, um, by the amount of resources you're using. Um, there are models out there that are concentrating on just actual provisioning costs or on your running costs or a combination of both. Let's talk a little bit about deployment modes. VMware wants you to distinguish between private clouds, community clouds, um, public clouds and hybrid clouds. So a private cloud is usually used by only one single organization. It's, it tends to be on-premise because you're privately using it. And usually it also is uh, pretty much firewalled off to the rest of the world. A public cloud is basically the complete opposite. It is hosted outside. It's provisioned for use for general public. Um, Windows Azure, vCloud hybrid services, or um, AWS would be examples for public cloud. Everyone can book in there. Everyone can use the resources. Then there's the concept of a community cloud. Um, this is somewhat a mixture between both. Um, it's not for the general public, but it is for entities that share a common interest. So if you had a university campus and each and every department which had uh, interest to provide their student body computer cloud components, that would be a community cloud. And last but not least, we do have the hybrid cloud. Um, this usually is a com uh, combination or also a combination of um, the above mentioned. Um, and the use case is to enable data and application portability. So this is also known as cloud bursting. So a hybrid cloud in most cases um, combines a private and a uh, and a public cloud. So if you're running out of resources from your private cloud, you can cloud burst, you can move your, uh, move your workloads for a limited amount of time into the public cloud. You will also need to know a little bit about compute, uh, computing mode models. There are basically three of them that are relevant for the exam. In the distant past, VMware also introduced two more. Um, so the first one you should know is Software as a Service, SAAS. And this is basically just giving you business applications um, without the need for yourself to actually have the infrastructure to host them. So software as a service, Salesforce, Google Mail, everyone has used those. The next step is platform as a service, PaaS. You're presenting technology-focused services to your customers. This is usually used um, to have specific um, development platforms, like the vFabric suit, um, given to your customers. So you've got a little bit more freedom, but you're still very, very static. The last one, the one that most customers are using with vCloud Director, is IaaS, Infrastructure as a Service. You're completely presenting the whole infrastructure containers um, to consumers, and you're usually also giving them either an API or an SDK um, so they can run their own automation task um, against us. This gives, gives you the most liberty. You can do the most with it um, out of these three um, computing models. 
so this is basically the focus of the exam. Some cloud use cases, those would be modernization to increase your business capacity and scale rapidly. Rapid provisioning of development and test services. Security and compliance assurance, even in the public space. And um, to really push forward business launches. For each use case, you can have your different um, compute models, etc. And that's basically what the exam is about to map the use cases to the technical abilities vCloud Director and the vCloud Suite components are giving you. So you will get a lot of questions. Customer has requirement X, Y, Z. Please map the, um, the specific use case for it. Um, what kind of allocation models do they need? Would they prefer a PAAS or an SS, uh, SAAS? component for this, you can expect a lot of questions on those. Our next objective would be to identify and categorize business requirements. So in here we are going to shortly talk about the VMware way of, of design. The VMware way usually resolves around these four words, requirements, risks, assumptions, and constraints. So what is a requirement? A requirement needs to be fulfilled for the design to be actually accepted by the customer. So this needs to be in place. Your design needs to actually fulfill this um, to be good to the customer. What is a risk? Risks tend to negatively impact the design. Um, budget is always a risk. Every customer is concerned about money. You might not get the money, or the customer might not get the money, even though, uh, even though he said so up front. If the customer's management says, uh-uh, you're not going to get it, you're not going to get it. This is a risk. Assumptions are basically goodwill guesses. You're assuming them to be true, so you think they're true, but you do not have an initial way of verifying this. So one example would be the customer actually does have enough VLANs to have a VLAN-backed um, networking pool. You will try to get rid of assumptions um, during the design process as much as possible because assumptions can turn into risks and you don't you basically do want to mitigate all of the risks. So either you verify your assumptions and then they're gone, or you put them down to the risk at the end of the project. The last thing are constraints. Those are imposed limitations on your design. If your customer does only have expertise in fiber channel uh, storage and doesn't want to train up for iSCSI or NFS-based storage, they will put a constraint on you to use fiber channel storage arrays. So you're bound to that decision. It is imposed on you uh, by a third party and you have to evolve your design around these constraints. Another one would be the customer for legal purposes needs to be able to save logs for 12 months. Then you do know, okay, A, I need to have some logging infrastructure in my design. B, I need to calculate uh, the storage needed to, um, to actually store those logs. The rest of the objectives, if we go back quickly, 
are more or less something that's really difficult to ask in an exam and score correctly. Um, you won't be gathering customer inventory data. That's just not feasible for an exam. Um, the customer business goals are usually given to you and you have to derive the requirements out of the business goals. So if, if one of the business goals is to um, to actually improve uptime of the services, you will know, okay, I will either need an N plus one or an N plus two cluster, and I will probably need to enable HA on it. And that's what I talked about in the beginning. Clusters, HA, et cetera, that's actually logical design. That's, that's not even conceptual overview anymore. So these things tend to blend together. Um, the last point is actually when you can fulfill this, you know you're good for the exam. If you get a random set of customer requirements and you do know the technology, which is of advantage if you want to take the exam, and you can actually determine the impact of which uh, technology would have on a design decision. For example, the impact of DRS, the impact of um, SDRS, the impact of having 10 gig versus 1 gig NICs. Um, so with, 10, with two 10 gig NICs, you're definitely going to need uh, network IO control, for example. Um, if, if you're very, very comfortable with that, you're good to take the exam. So capacity requirements. We are going to talk a bit, little bit about how storage and network do affect your design. Um, capacity always also uh, resolves around configuration maximums. VMware is trying to get rid of the, oh god, I have to remember everything exam kind of exams. So you probably won't need to learn the configuration maximums guides by heart, but it still doesn't hurt to, to have some decent numbers in there. So you kind of should know how many virtual uh, machines can one single vCenter um, hold. That would be 10,000. So if your customer is looking to um, host 15,000 VMs, you instantly know, okay, in the end, I will need at least two vCenter servers. Um, yeah, the rest is is very very broad um, from from the blueprint uh, print point of view. It is important um, that uh, you're being asked for uh, future capacity requirements, which means um, basically that you will have to use your calculator. Um, you will need to plan in for future growth. So it's basic percentage calculations. Not nothing too hard, but you if if you have been weak at math, you should brush up percentage knowledge again. If your customer has to, a ten percent growth rate, um, each year ten percent, you you should be able to just calculate off how much uh, resources will he need uh, within two, three, four years. So what should you consider when um, networking and storage requirements are there? Load balancing can be a factor. If you have more than one vCloud director cell, you want to load balance them. You can do the same for um, chargeback. You need to think about your security requirements, especially firewalls. Um, if you're having a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, you should know the most important ports um, to access your VM consoles, which ports will um, vCloud Director need to talk to its database, um, which ports will vCloud Director need to talk to vCenter, etc. So 
it doesn't hurt to, to memorize these ports. There's a KB article uh, which mentions all of the ports. Um, it will be in the speaker notes. If you have applications um, that require netting, this needs to be planned in your network design. Um, for the conceptual design, it's more like, do I actually need nothing? So this should be um, in the probing questions. Um, logical design then would really go into, okay, which organization actually needs nothing? How do I implement the V-shared edges to fulfill the service requirement? Same for static routing. For conceptual design, it would be enough for you to need to know that my customer needs static routing, um, how from from which point of view uh, would he need the static routes, etc. The rest would be covered in the logical design. Same for external network access. So if the the apps from the catalog need internet access, you will need to provide external network access. If this is a complete secret organization that has the R&D department in the cloud, in a private cloud, you would be talking about isolated networks, business requirements actually driving the design. So then you wouldn't need to care about the port groups, um, etc., for the external network. If you're having more than one site or um, for disaster recovery, you might also consider the XLAN. Um, so basically, stretch layer two over layer three. For storage, um, snapshots. You should know if customers will need uh, snapshots. This will, you will need to know the limitation about snapshots. You can only have one snapshot on each v, uh, VM using um, vCloud Director. You can have more if you are using um, normal vSphere, but then we are not talking about a cloud environment anymore. You will need to decide for or against either thin and or fast provisioning. Um, you need to plan for the according shadow VMs. Um, you need to know the implications on the storage. If you're using thin and fast provisioning, um, you are in a scenario where you can over-provision your storage. So your customer deploys VMs, 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 they grow, and in, in the end, your storage array just dies because it's full. Um, your customer won't be very happy about that. So um, this will be usually told in the requirements. So you either get multiple choice on this, usually, or um, in, in the designs, um, you can normally either tag something um, or put small properties on something using the video tool. So carefully read through the requirements on each um, in each scenario, and if it's something storage related, um, they will clearly tell you what it is, what they need. Same goes for storage pooling. So are you using storage pools? Um, vCloud Director 5.1 which the exam is all about. It's not about 1.5, it's about 5.1. Uh, um, can't deploy to data stores anymore. You need to have storage tagged, either pools or data stores. You cannot specify a data store. You can already only um, specify a storage profile. So you should plan around that. Um, Usually in the Visio tools, those will just be generic pools of storage, which are labeled like ABC, gold, silver, bronze, uh, fast and slow. And your requirements, again, will tell you, okay, 
um, cluster X has access to the fast storage, um, VMY absolutely needs run on the gold storage, etc. And um, sometimes they are a bit, uh, a bit vague. Um, then you actually need to figure out, okay, which uh, storage does either not fulfill a requirement or is a limitation. So if, if they have um, security related VFs that absolutely need to be separated, um, you could also just put them on two different storage arrays if that's a requirement. So the business needs will drive the design. Future growth as well. Um, you should always keep a certain puffer for the VMs. So there might be questions uh, resolving around that. And yeah, if your data stores are full, your customers won't be happy. <laughs> Seen far too often. <laughs> Functional limitations, basically that's when you know, okay, I need to complete new vCloud director instance instead of just a, um, an additional cell. Um, there's a KV for all the limitations. I just put uh, some of the more common out there. So um, a use case I've seen, for example, was uh, with uh, backups. Either guy hosts have a certain number of paths and data stores they can mount. So this also becomes a limitation for vCloud director. If now the backup solution requires you to actually mount the double amount of data stores, and we had that case, <laughs> then you can very quickly in a scale out environment um, run into these things. Same for total number of VMs. If you're, if you have a design scenario where you are planning for a public cloud, um, you're stuck at 30, uh, 30,000 VMs. That's not too many customers. So um, if you're having such large scale deployment, you won't get away with only one vCloud director deployment. You will need several instances. And then need to think of an idea how to pull them actually together, so that this is abstracted from your uh, from your customers. It's not covered in the exams. Um, as the cloud automation center with um, different service endpoints is not covered by the exam, but um, in real life, <laughs> you you might really really fast run into one of the configuration maximums. So for, for the exam, just know the most common ones by heart. And um, usually VMware really tends to go away from, from that kind of question. But if you're expecting business growth in the next three years to go through the roof and grow by 50%, this would be one of the questions where it's actually designed against. So. Um, you should always keep future growth uh, in mind for the functional limitations. So our next topic will be availability. We will talk a little bit about the separation of compute and management resources and also the different um, ways you can introduce high availability. We will shortly define what high availability means. And for the SLA part for that objective, we are actually going to wait a couple of minutes because that has its own sub-objective um, 1.6 where it's covered in detail. So, first I want to start with the ways that you, that you actually can use to, to protect um, your management and resource components. The easiest one being HA. It can protect both. 
so your resource and your management components. And it will simply restart machines that are failed. It won't help against corruption, for example. If your system never be thought, um, if you don't have a power failure or anything, but um, services just stop, um, then HA won't help. For most of the vCenter stack that vCloud Director relies on to provision VMs, you can use vCenter Heartbeat to um, protect the vCenter service. If you don't have a running vCenter service, vCloud Director cannot deploy any vApps. And for your um, cloud workloads with a little bit of power, uh, power CLI magic, um, there's a white paper out there referenced in the speaker notes. And also for your management components, if you've got a fatal data center failure, earthquake, plane crash, um, you can fail over services to, the, uh, to a different site. And there's also a second site to SRM, even though um, vCloud Connector is pretty much pushed in the exam. SRM, with the help of vSphere replication, can also help you to actually implement a hybrid cloud uh, scenario. You can fail, o fail over from one site to another site. So you can actually fail over your VMs to your public cloud infrastructure if it supports it. Some uptime requirements. Um, you don't not need to know these by heart. I, they are not mentioned in the blueprint. You, you should have a rough idea of what it means to, uh, what the difference means um, between five nines and two nines. But um, these actually drive your design. These drive if you need heartbeat, if you need SRM, if you need um, HA. If your customer cannot be down for more than six seconds per week, HA is not good enough. You need to look into other options, clustering, for example. Um, if your boot times are more than 10 minutes, even achieving three nines, which is the bare minimum um, for, for cloud providers, might be hard. So if, if you've got a bootstorm scenario <laughs> and um, every week, you, you should test if, if all your VMs can actually boot up in 10 minutes. Otherwise, you're not going to hit your SLA. And you will might possibly get you and customers over this. So um, you actually need to be aware of how long does it need to boot, um, what's the RPO and RTO. So the recovery point of objective and um, the recovery time objective, those both combined also determine which kind of service you can offer. If you need, if your resource needs more than 10 hours on, on a single run because it's slow, you're not going to be able to give three nines. It's as simple as that. So what's the management component? Management is basically everything you use to manage your vCloud environment. So it's your vCenter servers, um, your databases, the vCloud director salts, the vCloud director databases, um, the networking and security manager chargeback, because that's basically your billing tool. Um, in larger deployments, it's also orchestrator, update manager, heartbeat, etc. SRM. The other side is your cloud workloads. These should be separated from the management cluster. I, A, for compu uh, security reasons. B, for actual billing purposes. Depending on the size of the environment, um, your management cluster can have quite a uh, performance impact. 
on this. So if you want to build your customers, you shouldn't touch their workloads. These should be independent. And protecting the actual resource components, usually there's nothing that uh, speaks against HA. So in, in most deployments, you will at least have HA enabled. Um, for disaster recovery, uh, as I said, it's, it's usually um, SRM. If you're talking only VMware software with um, a little bit of resignaturing and um, some, some changes done to the actual environment so they can boot up exactly. And if you have important in-cloud workloads, you basically would design these workloads from a catalog point of view um, to, to use gas clustering, for example. So you would design your VApps um, to be self-contained and clustered. For objective 105, this will be rather short. Um, since half of the blueprint security standards and compliance standards really doesn't have to do too much with VMware itself. So this is not the CISSP. You won't be heavily tested on them. It doesn't hurt if you know what they mean. Um, the other part we should edge security capabilities and logging capabilities. You should know these by heart. So some compliance standards would include SOX, um, the HIPAA, PCI, DSS, and several ISO standards. You should just know um, one is for banking, one is for um, medical companies, and one is for credit card companies that handle credit card data or payments or save any credit card related data. Um, that's basically all you need to know about standards. Um, you won't get in-depth questions about what you actually need to implement to be um, either HIPAA or um, PCI compliant. Um, keep in mind the best practice is just um, a isolate these, if they are somehow mentioned, they should always be uh, some kind of isolation and all the security features um, should be enabled on those. For auditing purposes, most of them include a passus that you have to have a certain lock retention policy. Um, these usually resolve around 6 to 12 months. You should know that you can um, put these in place on vCloud Director and vShield Edge uh, where, where they're most important for your cloud environment. It's the same for your vCenter server. You can have um, tasks and events um, archived away in the database. Um, the default value doesn't set a retention policy, so they are always there. And that way, you can build a complete auditing trail. You should know um, where to configure syslog shipping on vCloud Director and um, the vSHIT appliances. Um, it's not the CIA, so you don't know, uh, need to know how the exact procedure is. That's one of the objectives of the CIA. But you need to know that you actually can do it and possibly design for it. So a special syslog server should be in the design, for example, if log shipping is requested. You also can turn on firewall logging, which in an ultra-secure environment, DMZ, for example, would be one of the options. Again, this would tend to be rather logical and physical design than conceptual. 
but yeah, in, in the blueprint, VMware yeah, isn't really clear um, about the distinguishment between those. Some security features. <coughs> Sorry. Not really asked in the, uh, in the blueprint, but the underlying research stack um, is fully certified. Same goes for um, vCloud Director. It does offer multi-tenancy. These tenants are actually isolated. You can isolate them on the organizational level, for example, um, using per-organization firewalls. If you even need to go deeper, you can have per VAP firewalls. You can completely cut the connection. They can be self-contained with isolated networks without any uplink port groups so that traffic never leaves the E6i host where those are run, leaving not even the slightest possibility of another organization to look into your R&D stuff because they simply can't connect to it. You do have add-up capabilities, so you can add an add-up or an Active Directory server to vCloud Director for uh, organizations to manage their own users and groups so that they are not dependent on the cloud provider. They can actually leverage their own systems, which they have control over, not the cloud provider. Same goes for role-based access control. You can either define new roles or use the standard build-in roles, but you have granular permission models with these. So if there's a requirement that finance can only do this while um, R&D can only do this, you would design this around the roles. The last objective goes into service definitions, so service level agreements. We'll shortly talk about SLAs, and um, I will talk about um, catalogs a little bit in here. So what's an SLA? An SLA is a service level agreement, a mutual agreement. So the provider as well as the tenant agree on this. Usually the tenant agrees on the price and the provider agrees on certain qualities that he will provide. An SLA handles guarantees, responsibilities, and limits for availability. So this usually means uptime. An uptime in a sense of systems are not only up and pingable, but systems actually do work. SLAs can resolve around backup procedures, RPO, RTO, schedule, data retention, how far can we go back, how fast can we go back, how much data do we lose in the worst case. It's not good if you can restore within five minutes, but your oldest backup is two weeks old. You still lose two weeks data, even if you can restore it in five minutes. You have, can have service um, SLAs in nearly every support contract. There are service SLAs, so initial response. Some do even have initial um, resolution time. The higher, the better, usually the less, the better, and the much more expensive. You can have performance SLAs. Um, standard example, bronze 7200 um, RPM disks versus gold SSD disks. You can have SLAs around compliance. So this means um, that the cloud provider, for example, is going to take care of the logging. Um, that the cloud provider will ensure that the infrastructure is uh, configured in such a way that they can guarantee um, HIPAA or PCI or SOX compliance and usually they get um, certified for this 
um, which is quite a costly process. The same goes for user account management or uh, metering um, combined on the, the word of operations. For example, I'm using a cloud service where I can only add users every 24 hours. So if, if I add a user at noon, he won't have access. He will only have access 6 a.m. the other day. Time zone differences. I'm, I'm not willing to pay more so that they get instant access. I can live with that. Billing is the same way. So how frequent are you built? How long is your billing historic, uh, history kept? Um, personal experience in Germany you need to keep your financial records for at least six years. So if the SLA is uh, that this will be permanently deleted after three years, as a German company, you would have a problem with such a cloud provider. When you're talking about SLAs, this um, from a logical design point of view, tightly ties into the allocation models. Um, again, allocation models are usually too deep for, um, for conceptual design, but um, VMware really doesn't care about the differences too much. So you all should know that there are three allocation models. first one being pay as you go, which is usually either for short-term workloads or um, if you're just beginning to explore the cloud. The important thing is for the business requirement, um, it will usually mention that the customer doesn't want to have any upfront in, uh, investment or that he only wants to pay for the resources he's actually using. Um, if, if you read either of those, you instantly know, okay, somewhere it's pay as you go. Um, also, if you need specific uh, workload preservation on demand. The allocation pool usually reserves a certain percentage of resources and still gives you the um, option to burst, but the burst capacity is not guaranteed. And use case, yeah, cloud bursting. The last one is the reservation pool. If you really want to take your tier one applications to the cloud, <coughs> so your mission critical data, then you would really need to think about a reservation pool where 100% of the resources is guaranteed. So the customer requirements usually more or less directly map to the um, to the allocation model that you will design around. Catalog requirements. Um, first step to be a cloud provider is to have standardized offerings. So you will standardize on small, medium, large, extra large, for example, and have these in there for catalog design. Usually what VMware tries to push into people's minds is to have an extra organization um, with admins in there that do the catalogs and then share it out to organizations where the org admins of these uh, different organizations can then choose their pick um, plus still have their own offerings. You can have different workload characterizations in your catalogs. Um, transient applications would be infrequently used, but still important, um, that exist only for a short time and uh, only deployed for a short task or need. Um, perfect example would be R&D or test machines. If they serve the purpose, if they're broken, throw them away. Um, deploy new. Then there's the highly elastic ones. Um, this is best explained with financial applications. These might get uh, spikes 
during the uh, usual financial cycle. So at the end of each month, at the end of each quarter, these would feel um, higher impact than on normal operations. And then there's the normal steady state workload. So uh, normal working VMs, your web servers, etc. You can also evolve your um, catalog about um, certain application types. So what does this distinguish um, Windows Azure from the cloud hybrid services? For example, the range of operating systems that customers can deploy. You can have specific offerings um, about infrastructure applications. So Exchange, SQL servers, or predefined. Same for application frameworks. So if you've got application developers, they will always need um, their usual three-tier application so, or two-tier application, front-end database, um, actual workload calculator. You can have offerings for those. And you can ha also have certain business applications um, that your customers might need. So I think I made it quite in time. <laughs> because I'm done, and I would be open for question now. So who has the first question? Um, if you guys have any questions, let's stick them in the question area, um, and I'll get them asked. Um, also, I know just a lot, a lot of the stuff in this conceptual design, because um, I'm trying to go through it also, um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of this stuff is also covered in the VCAT, and then we did have a question, for some, and with the slides and the recording be available for the slides, I'll get off track, I'll try to put on a cache, and the recording we normally stick on YouTube and we embed it into a blog posting that people can see it, and then it's also available for download. Um, yeah, and thanks for the VCAT open. So there's a new yeah. VCAT that's come out recently, um, so that, that's really good. And from the people I've spoken to, they've said that if you if you know the VCAT back to front, then you should be in good stead for the exam. Um, yeah, because basically it's it's everything you could want. Yeah, basically it's downloadable as a zip file of either PDF or HTML packages. Um, the VCAT 3 resolves around vCloud Director um, 5.1 and later. Um, there is a VK, uh, VCAT 2, which was initially designed for um, vCloud Director uh, 1.5. But what I really, really like about this and um, that everyone should read because even if there's some version specific but it gives you the methodology are uh, these two the private VMware Cloud and the public VMware Cloud implementation example. These go basically through the whole design process of uh, requirements, how to design your cloud, etc. So even if you're attempting VCDX, this is a brilliant read to go through. Mm -hmm. Um, this is available free per PDF or also as a hardcover book uh, fr uh, from John. Yeah, you, you can also get the Kindle version, which is the one I've gone through also. Um, does it seem like there's any questions on anyone? Uh, if not, um, at 8 o'clock on the dot. So, uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, then later on, maybe something pops into your mind or you're watching this recording and you want to ask some questions, then, yeah, um, you can tweet it out with the hashtag B Brown Bag. And, yeah, as I said, most of those 
keep an eye on it. And yeah, Frank, as Frank said, he's also available on Twitter. Um, he does have a full-time job and a fiance, so don't be upset if he doesn't respond straight away. Um, but yeah, that was good. Thanks a lot, Frank. That was really good and really helpful. Um, I'm glad we've got through all the objectives. I think you've done all of them. <laughs> um, but awesome. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Hopefully, um, everyone got what they wanted out of it. And um, next week, actually, I should have said it at the start of it. So next week, we're we're starting to do a lot of a network networking series. So we're, next week we've got Brett Levin covering the Cisco Learning Network Tour. Um, we've actually got three weeks of Cisco stuff, and then we've got over a month of the BCP track. So I should say thanks to Jonathan Frapier for organizing a lot of it. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks again, Frank, for presenting, and I'll try and encode this and get it up and available for people as soon as possible. You can watch it again or watch it in your own time. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Great. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Have a good evening all. Yep. Bye. Bye.